Nick, to Great, you. thank you. So uh, our next speaker is um, Beth Myers, um, who's come down from Leicester. She's a consultant haematologist um, and has enormous interest in mast cell activation, which of course is of great interest to, to, to POTS because of the overlap um, and perhaps wasn't of great interest to lots of other people until COVID, um, when I think people started to realise that quite a lot of what we hear has something to do with histamine. So hopefully um, we will hear in enormous detail about how we recognise and manage. Enormous detail and uh, very fast. And yes. very great <laughs> detail. I think yes. that's all we're looking for. Okay. Uh, good Short afternoon. but powerful. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the invitation from uh, the Society. Um, disclosures. Um, well, I am uh, an advisor to Mass Cell Action Group, and they also have a paediatric advisory board. Um, and the other thing is that I've not had COVID, despite all my family having it and many of my patients yet. So, um, so mast cells, a little bit about mast cells. Um, so basically they are innate immune cells, that heterogeneous, they're everywhere in the body, and so they can cause symptoms anywhere. And we define mast cell activation syndrome. It's part of a spectrum of mast cell disorders, which uh, includes mastocytosis, where my first interest came in this area, hereditary alpha tryptosema, which is a relatively new condition, and some other conditions uh, with, with an umbrella term of mast cell activation disorders. Um, for instance, in our haematology clinic, we also see patients with antiphospholipid syndrome who have mast cell activation as part of their condition. We now know that mast cells have a huge number of receptors, over 200, and over a thousand mediators have been described, not all in every cell, obviously. Um, and they result in excessive release of inflammatory mediators, which respond to triggers which are not normally uh, typically harmful, such as foods, perfumes, stress, exercise, and things like that. Um, and there's a wide range of symptoms across multiple body systems. So really, you need to be a general physician, as has been mentioned this morning, to uh, pull everything together for these patients. There are strong associations with POTS and hypermobile EDS, what we call the trifecta, and there's overlap in the symptoms. So GI symptoms could be due to POTS, they could be due to EDS, or they could be due to mast cells lying in the gut. And any individual patient, it could be very different to any other individual patient with mast cell activation syndrome. And in the same patient, those symptoms will vary over time and including the number of triggers which may escalate. So we try to have these three diagnostic criteria. So multiple symptoms across a number of different body, organ or tissue systems. And where possible, we try to find evidence of mast cell mediators in raised amounts. So in mast cell activation syndrome, the serum triptase is often normal or low, although it's raised in conditions like mastocytosis. A 24-hour urine sample for N-methyl histamine, or more often uh, productive is a prostaglandin, DM, D2, or F2-alpha uh, metabolites. Um, and that, that collection needs to be kept chilled throughout the collection and uh, through its transit to the lab, which is often a, a, an issue. And then the third is response, or at least partial response to either mast cell stabilizers or mast cell mediator blockers like antihistamines. So what evidence have we got for some relationship between MCAS and long COVID? So back in 2020, um, Dr. Afrin and colleagues in the States put forward a position paper um, discussing that um, post-COVID illness might be rooted in mast cell activation, or at least some of the symptoms that result. Um, we know that mast cells are activated by the COVID virus, and mast cells may be a driver of acute hyperinflammation in COVID. 
also, um, they found that drugs with activity against mast cells or the mediators are helpful in these patients. And we found that in our own experience, not all, but some. And that mast cell patients seem to have less severe disease in acute COVID if they were stable on mast cell stabilizers. And so they suggested that mast cell treatment may help in long COVID. And they've highlighted the overlap <clears throat> in symptoms between muscle activation and long COVID, highlighted in bold. And we, we're also publishing a, um, an article showing something similar in this graphic, where the red highlighted uh, terms are shared between MCAS and long COVID. So the same American group, uh, this time led by Lenny Weinstock, um, developed a further study in 2021. So they, like us, give patients a mast cell questionnaire when they attend clinic. And they approached um, a long COVID-focused Facebook group um, and recruited um, a number of them, 136 patients with long COVID, most of them were female to assess their symptoms before and after having COVID. They had 136 controls and 80 mast cell activation patients, most of whom also were female. And um, so they plotted using a spider plot. And so if, um, if we just look at this um, in uh, sections, so the general population can, can controls and pre-COVID, long COVID participants in the study, they've got ex exactly the same pattern in their symptom and severity analysis. Whereas post-COVID, long COVID patients and mast cell activation patients before treatment also had very similar um, symptoms and severity analysis. And the mast cell activation symptoms were increased in long COVID, mimicking symptoms and severity reported by patients who have MCAS. So they concluded that the in increased activation by aberrant mast cells induced by COVID infection by various mechanisms, which they didn't go into, may underlie at least part of the pathophysiology of long COVID and suggesting routes um, to effective treatment as we use in mast cell patients. So the, the next few slides are kindly supplied by Mast Cell Action Group. And they did a survey earlier this year um, on patients uh, who are also medical professionals. There's been a significant influx to the Mast Cell Action Group uh, for information and advice regarding mast cell symptoms. Um, after being infected with COVID. So this is a relatively small survey and there were 32 responses. Most of these were female and majority aged between 30 and 50. About half um, experienced the acute phase of uh, COVID for at least two weeks, but most didn't require hospital care or oxygen as part of their acute process. So these are the results. Um, and as you can see, um, GI, musculoskeletal, skin, respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurological symptoms were all well represented. Um, and um, they, many of the patients had been in, um, investigated and diagnosed with POTS, 14 out of the 32, but only five had had investigations um, and diagnosis of MCAS and a similar small number with chronic fatigue or ME. So they concluded that based on this small sample that MCAS seems to be a condition that overlaps with the diagnosis of long COVID in keeping with the American uh, group's conclusions and POTS. And um, they haven't got information pre-COVID as to whether this was a novel development of MCAS or whether there were some symptoms which were escalated um, that pre-exist in health conditions. A high proportion of the patients were investigated for POTS, but 
but investigations for MCAS were much less uh, established and undertaken at lower frequency. So um, this profile, multi-system profile of long COVID, particularly where there's allergic or inflammatory symptoms of GI, respiratory and skin present, indicate that there's a wider assessment for mast cell activation could be considered. And as always, we need to do some more research. So what tests and treatments have we got, um, those which are in the UK? Not as many as other countries, sadly. Um, we can do serum tryptase, but as I've already said, in mast cell activation, um, most patients do have a normal or low level. We can do chromogranin A, but often that's not handled um, correctly in terms of keeping um, chilled uh, during transit. The most useful I found is the prostaglandin, urinary prostaglandins, and it should be 24 hour and kept chilled throughout, as I mentioned previously, and N methylhistamine again, 24 hour urine. So um, briefly, what treatments have we got that we currently use in the UK? So um, number one is always avoid triggers if they recognize what the triggers are, carry an EpiPen if they have severe allergic reactions. H1 and H2 receptor antagonists. H2 we know um, augments the effect of H1 uh, blockers. Mast cell stabilize, I'll mention again in the next slide. Montelukast, uh, which is an uh, anti-leukotriene substance. So um, it will block um, the effects of leukotrienes released by the mast cells. Something that over the last few years I've used more often is uh, low dose naltrexone, not well known to uh, many people. It's an anti inflammatory agent, has been around for many, many years, um, and uh, is often um, a useful uh, starting point to calm the mast cells before adding in other, other medications. Attention to foods, um, avoiding processed foods and high histamine foods and having fresh food is important. And then other non-medical uh, management such as mindfulness and other coping strategies to these dogs. And then a few other things that are in brackets um, because some of them are not easily available. Mast cell stabilizers include sodium chrome glycate, which is really gut specific. Uh, so if there are ma abnormal mast cells that are causing the GI symptoms, sodium chrome glycate is a good uh, stabilizer for these. Um, it's um, it's uh, large capsules, and so some patients open the capsule so that if they do react to the capsule itself, they're just getting the pure substance. And ketotophen um, is a substance which is must, uh, is must cell stabilizer as well as having antihistamine activity. And then um, vitamin D is a must cell stabilizer. Vitamin C helps and uh, bioflavonoids like quercetin um, and luteolin um, and, and lots of other um, substances which are not medical uh, are often helpful for patients. Aspirin we sometimes use, but many patients react to that. So, <laughs> two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, I came to this case history to, uh, very recently. So these were my just quick thoughts about it. So on the right, we've got some of the symptoms that I think could overlap with mast cell um, activation syndrome. Obviously, palpitations and heavy chest pain would be uh, not necessarily mast cell, but there's a, a syndrome called Kunis syndrome, which is related to mast cells and is uh, a condition where there is acute coronary syndrome. So, so those um, cardiac related symptoms could be um, mast cell. And so um, my thoughts uh, on the left here, um, brain fog and fatigue, um, low, dose, low dose naltrexone has been helpful in some of my patients and good quality magnesium, especially magnesium three and eight, which crosses the blood brain barrier. Um, obviously for urticaria, H1 blockers and would add in the H2, uh, Montelukast, uh, if we think that's relevant. Um, we always have 
to listen to what the patient's saying and their concerns and refer for further support. But I always emphasize that this is not all in your head, um, but that the brain and the mind has an impact on the body as well. And we need to take that into account. <coughs> So um, being in a silo in secondary care, I might refer for a cardiology opinion and um, a neurological opinion. Um, and even think about using low-dose naltrexin for some of the neurological symptoms. At least it's been shown to be helpful in erythromyalgia. Um, and, and also thinking about this poor lady situation, um, provide a letter of support and guidance for her employer. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody got a question here in the room? Oh, we've got one at the front. I'm only get, probably going to take one seat because we do have, whilst you're going there, we do have Wayne who, give us a Wayne. I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. I'm from uh, mast cell activation, and he's here with the stand. So maybe your mast cell questions, if you've got any, along with you, can 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 come at coffee break and stuff. But we've got one here at the front. Hi, I'm Jessica Eccles. Um, I'm interested in hypermobility, but I'm also interested in um, trying to set up a trial of low dose naltrexone. Oh. And I wondered how you um, are you able to? Are you working in the NHS? Yes. Yes. And are you able to prescribe, L get people yeah. to carry on prescribing like this? Now, well, um, good question. Yeah. So we, we have, um, when I first started um, prescribing it, it had to be a private prescription and patients got it via a, a Glasgow pharmacy yes. with a lot of experience. Um, and more recently, um, Leicester has um, got, it, got it on formulary, which is very unusual, I know. Um, I've a Is that couple. because you're there? Um, well, it was actually, it was put in place by my paediatric colleague, so which I benefited from. <laughs> um, but um, very few GPs, um, because, because of um, the rules and regulations about what drugs they can use, um, have taken it on. Uh, two, two GPs around the country have. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sure lots of people on the chat would have been interested. Yeah, in absolutely. That. And we that did come through and I'll just make reference to it that it did come through. And let's just take another one as well. Is that um, saying lots of people, patients not responding to antihistamines and the GP says that the NHS doesn't recognise the condition. Is there anywhere that they can go to, especially when the patient's out of work and cannot afford private care? Yes, is it, there anywhere? It's it's a huge problem, um, and um, we're we're actually inundated because there are very few places that um, really understand or yeah. will take people on. Partly because we we're given a twenty minute new patient slot and a ten minute follow up slot, and That's we have it. to somehow um, accommodate people. Is it is it a very quick short question, and then we'll come to your answer in a second? Yeah, what, what did you shout? EDS toolkit. EDS toolkit for anyone that's for GPs. Brilliant. EDS, I'm saying this here so online can hear it. EDS toolkit uh, from the RCGP includes MCAS for the people online who couldn't hear a good shout from the back. Is it a really quick question? Oh, with a really sure. quick answer. Oh, maybe not. I was just going to say that um, in my experience, people with MCAS um, come to us with very restricted diets. Um, sort of restricting histamine and gets further and further, further restricted, which poses a problem in terms of their recovery because they're often restricting some, some foods that actually might aid in their recovery, such as the bioflavonoids and those kinds of things. Any thoughts on that, please? Yeah, short thoughts. Okay, short thoughts. Um, well, Sorry. Not, not, all, not all do have that problem. Um, I tell them not to severely restrict just the very high histamine foods and possibly use um, thiamine oxidase if they think that might be relevant just as a trial. Thank you. 